Welcome back to the Aria in Las Vegas. Dave Vellante with Dave Nicholson. Falcon 22, theCUBE's continuous coverage. Sean Henry is here, he's the president of the services division and he's the chief security officer at CrowdStrike. And he's joined by Kevin Mandia, CEO of Mandiant, now part of Google. Gents, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Congrats on closing the Google deal. Thank you. That's great, new chapter. New uh, chapter. Coming fresh off the keynote, you and George, I really en enjoyed that. Um, let's start there. One of the things you talked about was the changes. You've, mm -hmm. been, you've been in this business for a while. I think you were talking about you know, doing some of the <coughs> early stuff in the 90s. Um, wow, things have changed a lot. The Queen, right. right, you used to put the perimeter around the Queen, yeah. build the mm -hmm. moat, the Queen's left her castle. New ball game, but you were talking about the board level knowledge mm -hmm. of security in the organization. Talk about that change that's occurred in the last uh, decade. You know, boards are all about governance, right? Making sure everybody's doing the right things. And they've kind of had a hall pass on cybersecurity for a long time. Like we expect them to be great at financial diligence. They understand the financials of an organization. You're going to see a maturity, I think, in cybersecurity where I think board members all know, hey, there's risk out there. And we're on our own to kind of defend ourselves from it. But they don't know how to quantify it and they don't know how to express it. So bottom line, uh, boards are interested in cyber and we just have to mature as an industry to give them the tools they need to measure it appropriately. Sean, one of the things I wanted to ask you, so Steven Schmidt, I noticed, changed his title from CISO, Chief Inf Information Security Officer to Chief Security Officer. Your title is Chief Security Officer. Is that a nuance that has meaning to you or is it just, Less acronym. It depends on the organization that you're in. In our organization, the chief security officer owns all risks. So I have a CISO that comes underneath me, yep. and I've got a uh, security folks that are handling our facilities, our personnel, uh, those sorts of things, all, all of our uh, offices around the globe. So it's all things security. One of the things that we found, and Kevin and I were actually talking about this earlier, is this intersection between the physical world and the virtual world. And if you've got adversaries that want to gain access to your organization, they might do it remotely by trying to hack into your network, but they also might try to get one of your employees to take an action on their behalf, or they might try to get somebody hired into your company to take some nefarious act. So from a security perspective, it's about building an envelope around all things valuable, and then working it in a collaborative way. So there's a lot of interface, a lot of interaction, and a lot of value in putting those things together. And, and you're also president of the services division. Is that a P&L role, or? It, it uh, is, okay. we, ha we have a, uh, yeah, it's P&L, uh, and we have an entire organization that's doing incident response, and uh, it's a lot of the work that we're doing with, with Kevin's folks now. Um, so I've got both of those hats today. Okay, so self-funded. So, <laughs> in a way. Okay, where are companies most at risk today? Huh. You want to go on that one first, Sean? Uh, you talk faster than me, so it's bigger bang for the buck if okay. you talk. You know, when I, when I think about, about companies in terms of, of their risk, it's a, a lot of it has to do with the expansion of the network. Companies are adding new applications, new devices, they're expanding into new areas, there are new technologies that are being developed every day and that are being um, embraced every day. And mm -hmm. all of those technologies, all of those applications, all of that hardware is susceptible to attack. Mm -hmm. Adversaries are looking for the vulnerabilities they can exploit. And I think just kind of that sprawl is something that is, is disconcerting to me. From a security mm -hmm. perspective, we need to know where our assets are, where the vulnerabilities lie, how do we plug the holes, and having that visibility is really critical to ensure that you're, you're in, involved in mitigating that, that uh, new architecture. Anything you'd add? Yeah, I would, like when I, so I can just tell you what I'm hearing from CISOs out there. They're worried about identity, the lateral movement that's been kind of part of every impactful breach. So identity is kind of top three of mind. I would say zero trust, whatever that means. And we all have our own definitions of migration to zero trust and supply chain risk. You know, but whether they're the supplier, they want to make sure they can prove to their customers they have great security practices, or if they're a consumer of a supply chain, they need to understand who's in their supply chain, what are their dependencies, how secure are they. Uh, those are just three topics that come up all the time. As we extend, you know, talking about XDR, the X being extend, do you see physical security as something that's being extended into, or is it, or is it already kind of readily accepted that physical security goes hand in hand with 
information security? I don't think a lot of people think that way. There certainly are some, and Dave mentions uh, Amazon and Steve Schmidt is a CSO. Right. There's a CISO that works for him as well. CJ, there's right. clear integration, there's an intelligence component to that, and I think that there are certain organizations that are starting to recognize and understand that when we say there's no real uh, perimeter, it, it expands, the network expands into the physical space. And if you're not protecting that, you know, if you don't protect the, the server room and somebody can actually walk in, the door's unlocked, you've got a vulnerability that might be exploited. So I think to, to recognize the value of that integration from a security perspective to be holistic and for organizations to adopt a security first philosophy that all the employees recognize they're, they're the, the first line of defense oftentimes, not just from a fish, but by somebody catching up with them and handing them a thumb drive, hey, can you take a look at this document for me? That's a potential vulnerability as well. So those things need to be integrated. I thought the most interesting part of the keynote this morning is when George asked you about election security, mm -hmm. and you immediately went to the election infrastructure. I was like, yeah, okay. Right, yeah. But then I was so happy to hear you, you went to the disinformation. I learned mm -hmm. something there about your monitoring the network effects, sure. and, and actually there's a career stream around that. Right. Um, the reason I had, so years ago I interviewed, uh, I think it was 2016, uh, Robert Gates, okay. former mm -hmm. defense secretary, and I, I said, yeah, but don't we have the best cyber, can't we go on the offensive? He said, wait a minute, we have the most to lose. Right. But, but you gave an example where you can identify the bots, like let's say there's disinformation right. out there, mm -hmm. you could actually use bots in a positive way to disseminate the, the truth, in theory. Good. Is, is that something that's actually so, happening out there? Well, I think we're all still learning. You know, you can have deep fakes, both audible files or visual files right. and, and images, and there's no question the next generation, you do have to professionalize the news that you consume, and we're probably going to have to professionalize the other side, critical thinking, because we are a marketplace of ideas in an open society, and it's hard to tell where's the line between someone's opinion and intentional deception. You know, and sometimes it could be to source a foreign threat trying to influence the hearts and minds of citizens, uh, but there's going to be an internal threat or domestic threat as well to people that have certain ideas and concepts that uh, they're zealots about. Is it enough to is it enough to simply expose where the information is coming from? Because you know, look, I, I could make the case that the Red Sox right. are a horrible baseball team, and you should right. never go to Fenway. And your Yankees jersey. Right, right. Yeah. So is that disinformation? Is that misinformation? He'd say hey. yes. Someone else would say no. But it would be good to know that a thousand bots from some troll right. farm are behind well, this. There's. It's helpful to know if something can be tied to identity or is totally anonymous. Start just there, yeah, yeah. and you can still protect the identity. Over time, I think all of us, if you're going to trust the source, you actually know the source, right? So I do believe, and, and by the way, much longer conversation about anonymity versus privacy, and then trust, all right? right. And all three you could spend this whole interview on. But uh, we have to have a trustworthy internet as well. And that's not just in the tech and the security of it, but over time it could very well be how we're being manipulated as uh, citizens and people. When you guys talk to customers and, and peers, when somebody gets breached, what's the number one thing that you hear that they wished they'd done that they didn't? I think we talked about this earlier, and I think identity is something that we're talking about here. How are you, how are you protecting your assets? How do you know who's authorized to have access, how do you contain the, um, the access that they have, and the, the area we see with, with these um, um, malware-free attacks where adversaries are using the existing capabilities of the operating system to move laterally through the network. I mean, Kevin's folks, my folks, when we respond to an incident, it's about looking at that lateral movement to try and get a full understanding of where the adversary's been, where they're going, what they're doing, and to try to, to find a root cause analysis, and um, it really is a, a critical part. So p part of the reason I was asking you, about, was it a P&L, because you, you wear two hats. Right, you've got revenue generation on one side, and then you've got you protect, you know, the company, and you got peer relationships. So the reason I bring this up is, I felt like when Stuxnet occurred, there was a lot of lip service around, hey, we as an industry are going to work together. And then what you saw was a lot of attempts to monetize, you know, private mm -hmm. data, sell private reports, and things of that nature. You were referencing today, Kevin, that you think the industry's doing a much better job of, of collaboration. Uh, is it, yeah. can you talk about that and maybe give some examples? Uh, absolutely, I mean, you know, I lived through it as a victim of yep. a breach a couple years ago. If you see something new and novel, 
I, I just can't imagine you getting away with keeping it a secret. I mean, I would even go, what are you doing harboring that? If you have it, that doesn't mean you tell the whole world. You don't come on your show and say, hey, we got something new and novel, everybody panic. You start contacting the people that are most germane to fixing the problem before you tell the world. So if I see something that's new and novel, I'm certainly calling Sean and the team at CrowdStrike saying, hey, there's, because they protect so many endpoints and, and they def defend nations. Uh, and you got to get to Microsoft, you have to talk to PAN, you have to get to the companies that have a large uh, capability to do shields up. Uh, and I think you do that immediately. You, you can't sit on new and novel. You get to the vendor where the vulnerability is. All these things have to happen at a great rate of speed. So I, you guys probably won't comment, but I'm betting dollars to donuts, this Uber lapsus hack, you guys, knew about? Uh, I turn to you. No comment. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that the, that wasn't novel. My point being, let me, let me ask it in a more generic fashion that you mm -hmm. can maybe comment. You, you're, I think you're, my, my inference is we're comp the industry is compressing the time between a zero day and Absolutely. a fix. Absolutely. Like dramatically. Yes. Oh, awareness of it and a fix, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And a lot of the hacks that we see as lay people in the media, you've known about for quite some time. Is that fair or no? Not necessarily. It's, you know, it's harder to handle an intrusion quietly and discreetly these days, especially with what you're up against. And, and most CEOs, by the way, their intent isn't let's handle it quietly and discreetly. It's what do we do about it and what's the right way to handle it. And they want to inform their customers and they want to inform people that might be impacted. Uh, I wouldn't say we know it. Uh, all that far ahead of time. And, and, Depends. And, yeah. and, and I, I think companies don't know it. Yeah. Companies don't know they've been breached for weeks or months or years yeah. in some cases, right. which talks a, about a couple things. First of all, some of the sophistication of the adversaries, but it also talks about the inability of companies to often detect this type of activity. When we're brought in, it's typically mm -hmm. very quickly after the company finds out because they recognize they've got to take action, they've got liability, they've got brand protection, there are a whole sort of, of things they need to take care of, and we're brought in. Um, it may or may not be, become public. But CrowdStrike was founded on the premise that the unstoppable breach is a myth. Now, that's a, that's a bold sort of vision. We're not there yet, obviously, and a, and a, and a, a CISO can't mm. you know, accept that, right? You've got to always be vigilant. But is that something that, is, that we're going to actually see manifest you know, in any, any time in the near term? I, I mean, thinking about the Falcon platform, you guys are users of that. I don't know if that is part of the answer, but part of it's technology, but without the cultural aspects, the people side of things, you're never going to get there. I can tell you, I started Mandy in 2004 with the premise, security breaches are inevitable, far less marketable yeah. than <laughs> you know, stop breaches, so. Yeah. I, I think you have to learn how to manage this, right? It's like healthcare. You're not going to stop every disease, but you, there's a lot of things that you can do to mitigate the consequences mm -hmm. of those things. The same thing with network security. There's a lot of actions that organizations can take to help protect them in a way that allows them to live and, and operate in a, in a, a strong yeah. Uh, position. If companies are lackadaisical, they're irresponsible, they don't care, those are companies that are going to suffer. But I think you can manage this if you're using the right technology, the right people, you've got the right philosophy, security first. And the yeah. culture. Well, right. I can tell you very quickly the three reasons why people think why is there an intrusion? It should just go away. Uh, well, wherever money goes, crime follows. We still have crime. So you're still going to have intrusions, whether it has to be someone on the inside or faulty software and people being paid to write faulty software. You're going to have war. That's going to create war in the cyber domain. So information warriors are going to try to have intrusions to get to command and control. So wherever you have command and control, you'll have a war fighter. And then wherever you have information, you have espionage. So you're going to have people trying to break in at all times. And, and to tie that up, because everything Kevin said is absolutely right, and nice. what he just said at the very end was people. There are human beings that are yes. on the other side of every single attack. And think about this, until you physically get, physically get to the people that are doing it and stop them, yes. this will go on forever because you can block them, but they're going to move, and you can block them again, they're going to move. Their objectives don't change because the information you have, whether it's financial information, intellectual property, strategic, military information, that's still there. They will always come at it, which is where that physical component comes in. If you're able to block well enough and they can't get you remotely, they might send somebody in. Well, in the keynote, I, I'm not kidding, I'm looking around the room and I'm thinking, there's at least one person here that is here primarily <laughs> to gather intelligence yes. to help them defeat what's being talked about here. 
Well, you it's said kind, it. It's, kind, it's Kevin, kind of creepy. You said you know, the adversary is, is very well equipped and motivated. You know, why do you rob banks? Well, that's where the money is. But it's more than that now. With state-sponsored terrorism and you know, exfiltration of state secrets, I mean, there's, it's high stakes this game. This has you become a tool of nation states yes. in terms of, from a political perspective, from a military perspective. If you look at what happened with Ukraine and yeah. Russia, all the work that was done in advance by the Russians to soften up the Ukrainians, um, not just collection of intelligence, not just denial of services, but then disruptive attacks to change the entire complexity of the battlefield. This, this is a, an area that's never going away. It's become ingrained in our lives and it's going to be utilized for nefarious acts for many, many decades to come. I mean, you're right, Sean. We're seeing the future of war right before us. Is, is, there's, there is going to be, there is a cyber component now in war. I think it signals the cyber component signals the silent intention of nations, period. The silent projection of power, probably before you see kinetics. And this is where Gates says, we have a lot more to lose as a country, so it's hard for us to go on the offensive. We have to be very careful about our offensive capabilities because well, of what One of what the things that, that we yes. do need to, to do, though, is we need to define what the red lines are to adversaries, because when you talk about human beings, you've got to put a deterrent in place so that if the adversaries know that if you cross this line, this is what the response is going to be. It's the way things were done during nuclear proliferation, right? During right. the Cold War. Here's what the actions are going to be. It's going to be it's going to be mutual destruction, and you can't do it. And we didn't have a nuclear war. We're at a point now where adversaries are pushing the envelope constantly, where they're turning off the lights in certain countries, where they're taking actions that are are quite detrimental to the host governments. And those red lines have to be very clear, very clearly defined and acted upon if they're crossed. As security experts, can you always tie that signature back? to say a particular country or a particular group? Absolutely 100% no. Every time, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, no. It, it's, uh, it's a great question. You, you need to get attribution right to get deterrence, right? And without attribution, where do you proportionately respond to whatever act you're responding to? So attribution is critical. Uh, both our companies work hard at doing it. Um, and it, and uh, that's why I think you're not going to see too many false flag operations in cyberspace, but when you do, and they're well crafted, where one nation masquerades as another, it, it, it's one of the last rules of the playground I haven't seen broken yet, um, and th that'll be an unfortunate day. Yeah, because that mutually assured destruction, a despot like Putin can say, well, it wasn't, it wasn't me. Right. right. <laughs> so and ironically, it's, it's human yeah. intelligence right. that ultimately is going to be the only way to uncover that. Human intelligence is a big component, right. for sure. And, and David, like when you go back to, you were referring to Robert Gates, it's the asymmetry of cyberspace. Right. One person in one nation that's not a controllable asset could still do an act, and it, it just adds to the complexity of, we have attribution, it's from that nation, but was it in order? Was it done on behalf of that nation? Uh, very complicated. So this is an industry of superheroes. Thank you guys for all you do. I appreciate you coming on theCUBE. Wow. I love your cape. Thank you. <laughs> 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 all right, keep it right there. Dave Nicholson and Dave Vellante. Be right back from Falcon 22 from the area. You're watching theCUBE.